All right, so Minnesota Representative Ilhan Omar has officially been removed from her placement on the House Foreign Affairs Committee after a GOP-led vote to kick her off. So I want to give you some of the basic facts surrounding this entire situation and give you my take on how completely absurd and ridiculous this entire situation is and some of the allegations that are being leveled against Ilhan Omar. But just to start us off here from CNN, they say the Republican-led House of Representatives voted on Thursday to pass a resolution to remove Democrat Representative Ilhan Omar from the powerful House Foreign Affairs Committee. And they say the House Republicans have argued that Omar should not serve on this committee in light of past statements that she has made related to Israel that in some cases have been criticized by both members of uh, or both parties as anti-Semitic. And Democrats have criticized the push to oust Omar, arguing that it amounts to an act of political revenge and that the Minnesota Democrat has been held accountable for her past remarks. And the party line vote was 218 to 211 with uh, this guy, this GOP rep, David Joyce from Ohio, apparently voting present for whatever reason. But I want to just emphasize here for a second that this criticism of Ilhan Omar, that she is somehow anti-Semitic for having critiques of the government of Israel, which according to every single reputable human rights organization around the world, including some that are based within Israel itself, is an apartheid state and is committing essentially an ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people, that you had both uh, both political parties, both Democrats and Republicans, who were insinuating that Ilhan Omar is anti-Semitic for criticizing the influence of Israeli lobbying groups over our politics here in the United States, okay? So I'm going to give you guys a little bit more details in terms of how that lobbying takes place, but the idea that it is anti-Semitic to criticize the government of Israel or the policies that they deploy is completely insane, okay? It would be absolutely no different than saying that having critiques of the government of Iran or having critiques of the government of Saudi Arabia is somehow Islamophobic. And nobody would ever say that because, again, it's completely fucking ridiculous, okay? But somehow we have this unique situation here where this country that we give billions and billions of dollars a year, including largely military aid, um, you know, that we have absolutely no ability to question this relationship that we have with, with this country that is again committing an apartheid against the Palestinian people and an ongoing ethnic cleansing, as well as, you know, very frequent uh, war crimes that are committed, especially against uh, the people who are living within the Gaza Strip, which I think is accurately called the world's largest open air prison for a reason. Okay, so this entire allegation that is being leveled against her, in my opinion, is beyond ridiculous at surface level. But they continue down here saying that Omar was defiant in a floor speech ahead of the vote, saying, my leadership and voice will not be diminished if I am not on this committee for one term. My voice will get louder and stronger. Longer. And she says, so take your vote or not. I am here to stay. I'm here to be a voice against the harms around the world and advocate for a better world. Okay, so that was Ilhan Omar's response to this. Now, we also have a statement here from Hakeem Jeffries, the, uh, you know, uh, who, the guy who was basically taking the place of Nancy, Nancy Pelosi and leading the Democrats in the House of Representatives. Hakeem Jeffries is absolute dog shit, if you ask me, but he basically characterized this as Republicans seeking political revenge, which I think is 100% accurate. Obviously, you had, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, who were, you know, removed from their committee assignments under a Democrat-controlled House. I think that there is a categorical difference between uh, Ilhan Omar versus Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar, but we can circle back around to that here in a second. He said, Hakeem Jeffries, I will move immediately to seat Representative Ilhan Omar on the House Budget Committee, where she will defend democratic values against right-wing extremism. Okay, so apparently Ilhan Omar is getting this position on the House Budget Committee. I guess that's great. Honestly, I would rather have her on the House Foreign Affairs Committee because I do think that she has good, valid criticisms of U.S. foreign policy around the world, but I guess that this is, uh, you know, somewhat of a temporary substitute that he is working in here. They continue saying that the action by House Republicans comes after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy officially denied seats on the House Intelligence Committee to representatives uh, Eric Swalwell and Adam Schiff, the former chairman of the panel, a decision that was condemned by Democrats. Listen, honestly, I don't give a single solitary shit if you remove Eric Swalwell and Adam Schiff from their committee assignments. I don't care about those guys. I have many different disagreements with those guys and their politics, so I'm not going to harp on that. Go for it. By all means, have fun. Take them off the committee assignments. But with Ilhan Omar, I think it is, again, categorically different because Ilhan Omar 
Omar is one of the very, very few voices within our Congress that is even willing to mildly critique in a substantive way U.S. foreign policy and specifically our relationship to authoritarian regimes around the country, whether that be the apartheid state of Israel or whether that be the government led by Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. She is, you know, a very solid critic of U.S. foreign policy around the world. And so I would rather have her on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. But, you know, again, she's being moved to this other committee, apparently by Hakeem Jeffries. They continue saying that McCarthy vowed last year, okay, so there's a little bit of evidence that this is definitely political revenge here, that if Republicans won back the House majority, that he would strip Schiff, Swalwell, and Omar of committee assignments, arguing that Democrats created a new standard when they held the majority by removing Republican representatives Marjorie Taylor Greene of my home state of Georgia and Paul Gosar of Arizona from committees for violent rhetoric and posts. And again, Again, it's important to emphasize here like sure you can make a, a you know somewhat of a valid argument that like okay uh, you know neither party depending on who's in power should just use their majority to remove people from their committee assignments just let it be I could see some semblance of an argument like that being somewhat valid and justified but the idea that Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar and the statements that they have made in the past the posts that they have made in the past should somehow be equivocated or uh, compared to things that Ilhan Omar has said is completely insane okay we're talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene somebody who pushed a conspiracy about Jewish space lasers starting fires in California okay somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar who both have very close ties with people like Nick Fuentes an open neo-nazi okay these are not the same things here okay so it's one thing to push actual like anti-semitic conspiracy theories about like you know a Jewish cabal of elites that's controlling the world in the banking sector and all of that versus having a critique of the government of Israel, okay? Not a critique of the Jewish people, okay? Not a critique of any ethnicity or religion or anything like that, of a government apparatus, okay? These are completely different things here. But somehow, according to these House Republicans, Paul Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who have engaged with actual extensive anti-Semitism, are somehow, you know, able to get onto a lot of these committee positions. But Ilhan Omar, that's completely unacceptable because she had some past statement about the influence of the Israeli lobby over our politics, which is literally a verifiable fact. I mean, it's not unique to Israel that other foreign governments are spending money to influence U.S. politics, okay? We have an incredibly rotten and corrupted political system here in the United States where essentially any billionaire, any millionaire, any, uh, you know, super PAC that is being funded by all sorts of different nefarious groups around the world. I mean, this would apply equally to Saudi Arabia as well. They all get their hands in the U.S. Uh, uh, political system and influence the politics and influence the legislation that is able to get passed or not passed. That is a, a fact, okay? This happens with many different countries around the world, but the idea, again, that it's somehow a, a you know, anti-Semitic trope to criticize the Israeli lobby, it's like, okay, it's completely absurd, right? Because you wouldn't have that same criticism when people are bringing up the influence of like a government like Saudi Arabia that they have over U.S. foreign policy as well. I mean, it's just a complete double standard that we're talking about here. But they say House Republicans now in the majority have given Green and Gosar their committee assignments for the new Congress. Okay, so again, Marjorie Taylor Green, Paul Gosar, these absolute deranged right-wing freaks, they get their committee assignments. Ilhan Omar, no, she's, uh, you know, somehow too, uh, uh, I guess, far away from the fray to be able to deserve that. Now, I want to move on to uh, a couple different Intercept articles that I have lined up here, which I think are uh, pretty revealing in terms of both the uh, failure of the Democratic Party to, uh, you know, actually stand by Ilhan Omar with some of the valid critiques that she has of the government of Israel, as well as uh, the actual verifiable fact that the Israeli government, along with, again, many other governments around the world, that they actually do have influence over the U.S. political system using a lot of these super PACs or using a lot of the pressure that they are able to apply against some of our political representatives. So here from Ryan Grimm, he says, pro-Israel lobby uh, caught on tape boasting that its money influences Washington. Okay, so they say a debate about the power in Washington of the pro-Israel lobby is underway after Representative Ilhan Omar responded sharply to reports that Republican leader Kevin McCarthy was targeting both Omar and fellow Muslim Representative Rashida Tlaib, a Democrat from Michigan. And this is where, you know, basically the anti-Semitic allegations come in here for Ilhan Omar. They say that Omar quoted the rap lyrics, quote, It's all about the Benjamins, baby, to suggest that McCarthy's move was driven by the lobby's prolific spending. And asked specifically who she was referring to, Omar responded, 
APAC. Okay, so let's pause here, right? She's, she's saying it's all about the Benjamins, baby. Now, if you were going to be a completely dishonest actor, okay, you would look at this situation and you would say, oh my God, Ilhan Omar is trying to insinuate and play on this trope against the Jewish people that they are somehow like in complete control over the global financial system or that, you know, Jews are obsessed with money or something like that, when that is not at all what she was actually saying here, okay? She was very specific about it, talking about APAC, okay? She's talking about a political lobbying group and the influence that other foreign countries or governments or, you know, whatever political lobby that it happens to be, this also applies domestically within the United States from the billionaire and millionaire class in corporate America, but she's she's talking about the influence of financial, you know, uh, whether it's donations or whether it's, you know, a multitude of different lobbying firms and all of these different institutions that we have legalized here in the United States, effectively legalized corruption and bribery. She's talking about the financial financial influence of a lot of these lobbying firms on politicians in the United States, okay? And she specifically references APAC, which spends millions and millions of dollars a year to influence U.S. policy towards the Middle East and towards Israel specifically, okay? So when she talks about it's all about the Benjamins, baby, she's not talking about the Jewish religion or Jewishness uh, or, uh, uh, you know, the Jewish ethnicity, okay? She's talking about specifically the corrupting influence of lobbying firms in the United States, and they are somehow trying to pretend as if this was some anti-Semitic trope. Now, Ilhan came out and apologized for this later after there was massive backlash from, again, Democrats and Republicans. I think that was honestly unnecessary. I mean, maybe you could say she could have chosen different words, but this is all just a game. I mean, this is completely absurd that anybody would think that this statement is actually anti-Semitic because, again, she has these same exact critiques for other governments like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, like so many different governments around the world. She's actually consistent on this, okay? But they single out this one response here to uh, pretend as if she is somehow anti-Semitic. But they continue out here saying that in November, the Electronic Intifada obtained and published the four-part series, but it did not during, uh, but it did so during the week of the midterm elections, and the documentary did not get a lot of attention. So they're talking about the actual influence of APAC and other political lobbying firms on behalf of Israel. They say in it, leaders of the pro -lo pro Israel lobbying, uh, pro Israel lobby, uh, speak openly about how they use money to influence the political process. Okay, so again, this isn't something that's unique to Jews. Okay, this is something that is unique to the American political system. But they say that they use this in ways so blunt that if the comments were made by critics, they'd be charged with anti-Semitism. And they say that David Oakes, the founder of Halev, which helps send young people to American Israel Public Affairs committee's uh, annual conference described for the reporter how APAC and its donors organize fundraisers outside the official umbrella of the organization so that money doesn't show up on disclosure as coming specifically from APAC. And he describes one group that organizes fundraisers in both Washington and New York, saying, quote, this is the biggest ad hoc political group, definitely the wealthiest in DC, adding that it has no official name, but it is clearly tied to APAC. And he says, it's the APAC group it makes a difference. It really, really does. It's the best bang for your buck, and the networking is phenomenal, okay? So again, they're just openly admitting it. Of course, this is not a conspiracy. We know how the American political system works. We know how rotten and corrupted that it is on both sides of the aisle. This is not a mystery. This is not something that is up in the air. Yes, of course, pro-Israel lobbying firms have influence over U.S. policy towards Israel and the Middle East. That is a verifiable fact, and that is the original point that Ilhan Omar was making that was then conflated with actual anti-Semitism, which is a real problem which should be addressed. But they continue, saying that without spending money, Oakes argues, the pro-Israel lobby isn't able to enact its agenda, saying, quote, congressmen and senators don't do anything unless you pressure them. They kick the can down the road unless you pressure them, and the only way to do that is with money. Okay, so is this guy anti-Semitic? Does this guy, a, a quote-unquote Jew hater, in the words of Ben Shapiro, who was literally called Ilhan Omar, a Jew hater? No, of course not, because he's just describing the reality that takes place. And just to give you one specific example of how this actually translates, some of this money can translate to actual foreign policy decisions within the United States, this one doesn't necessarily have to do with APAC, but we're talking about how U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, specifically related to Israel, is affected by large donors and, uh, you know, uh, financially backed interest groups. So here from Responsible Statecraft, this is a story that I talked about a couple of months ago. 
They say Trump tell all cites Sheldon Adelson's bankrolled Israel embassy moves. So remember, the United States under the Trump administration decided to move the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, which was obviously incredibly controversial because this is a contested area where, you know, by moving this uh, embassy here, you are essentially entrenching Israel's right to continue occupying this area that they have been occupying for decades illegally under international law. So it was incredibly, uh, uh, you know, incredibly, uh, uh, you know, scandalous this move that he made. But we got a little bit of insight in terms of why he decided to make this move. So they say Sheldon Adelson, the Republican Party's biggest funder over the past decade, the top GOP donor, used a $20 million donation to a super PAC to pressure then-President Donald Trump to adopt the highly controversial decision to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And that quid pro quo is described in this book by Maggie Haberman. Okay, so that part's not necessarily important. The point that's important here, okay, is that U.S. foreign policy is being swayed by big financial players on the international scene, whether that's Saudi Arabia, which also the Trump family and, uh, you know, guys like uh, his uh, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, have literally taken billions of dollars from uh, the Saudi government, okay? This this is goes across the board. It's not just Israel. It's also, again, Saudi Arabia, plenty of other countries around the world. They are all getting their financial uh, situation in order in order to try to pressure members of different various governments in order to, you know, uh, change the foreign policy policy that we are going about enacting within this region, okay? This is something that is across the board. This is how the American political system operates. So again, you have somebody like Sheldon Adelson, a, a you know multi-millionaire or maybe even billionaire Trump donor, a GOP donor who is funneling millions and millions of dollars into the GOP in order to sway our policy towards Israel. And then you have Donald Trump backing that up. So, you know, you could call this a quid pro quo, you could call it whatever you want, but this is not unique, okay? This is something that is baked within how the American political Political system operates. That's the main point that I want you guys to get away from my take on this uh, on this kind of a topic, right? Again, you have Trump's ties, whether it's through Jared Kushner and the multi-billion dollar investment that he got from the Saudi government. You have his ties to the Live Golf Tour. This applies to so many different situations, but it's bizarre to me that we have this one situation where the same thing that the Saudi government is trying to do to the Trump administration or to the Biden administration for that matter, the, the, the whitewashing of their atrocities, the whitewashing of some of the policies that they deploy within their country, that um, they're spending all of this money and it's like nobody has that same critique when it comes to Saudi Arabia nobody says oh you're Islamophobic if you're critiquing Mohammed bin Salman okay but somehow there's this unique subset of examples when it comes to Israel where people will turn around and say that you are anti-semitic for even insinuating at the idea that financial lobbying firms whose explicit purpose is to influence our foreign policy and our policy towards Israel that suggesting that that reality is taking place is somehow anti-semitic it is just a deflection it is just a distraction because they want to maintain again the hegemonic control over the current status quo and how we are operating our policy towards these countries. So I want to finish off here, okay? So they say, here from The Intercept, again, from Akella Lacey, I think this was a great uh, take again in terms of how Democrats fed in to all of this nonsense. So she says, how Democrats paved the way for Kevin McCarthy's attack against Ilhan Omar. So they say, congressional Democrats showed an unusually unified front in support of Representative Ilhan Omar from Minnesota as she faced attacks from House Speaker Kevin McCarthy as the leader of the Republican-controlled House, McCarthy succeeded Thursday in his attempts to strip Omar from her seat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where she had been a vocal critic of the war industrial complex and human rights abuses in which the United States has either been a primary actor or a sponsor. Okay, so listen, this is basically what this is all about. Okay, you could say maybe this is a little bit of political revenge for Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar. Sure, that probably plays a significant role with this. You know, I'm sure that Kevin McCarthy was cutting some deals with some of these people behind the scenes to get somebody like Ilhan Omar as well as Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell who I would put into a different category removed from their committee positions but this is what this is really about with Ilhan Omar okay it is not because you know, she is uh, anti-Semitic in any way, shape, or form. It is because she is a vocal, outspoken critic of U.S. foreign policy, U.S. imperialism, U.S. war crimes, our, you know, approach to how we are handling our Middle East policy, okay? That is why she was removed from this position. That's why they all have such a problem with her is because she is willing to actually go out there and talk about Palestinian human rights, okay? She's not willing to just completely toe the line with the status quo of supporting an apartheid ethnic cleansing regime in Israel, okay? Which, by the way, 
Hayes I've covered on this channel, their newly elected government is probably the most far-right government in Israel's history, which is saying a fucking lot. Okay, so, I mean, again, this idea that, like, you know, this is about her being anti-Semitic, no, it's not. It's 100% it's not. But they continued on here saying that McCarthy and his colleagues' attacks on Omar go back to 2019 and her first month in Congress when he called on Representative Nancy Pelosi, then the House Speaker, to remove Omar from the Foreign Affairs Committee. And McCarthy cited the Minnesota representative's criticism of Israel's human rights abuses and her support for the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, BDS, a Palestinian civil society movement working to build international opposition to Israel's occupation of Palestine. Okay, so again, Boycott, Divestment, Sanction is the same exact strategy that was used in apartheid South Africa. We are now trying to apply this to the same similar situation in apartheid Israel. Okay, so he is basically, again, trying to conflate the idea that you have have a critique of apartheid or ethnic cleansing with anti-semitism i mean what are we really talking about here again it's just so ridiculous at face value but they say at the time representative lee zeldin who was most recently new york's republican gubernatorial candidate tweeted that he was disappointed that omar had also been appointed to the foreign affairs subcommittee on oversight and accused her of harboring anti-semitic and anti-israel hate and shortly afterward, Democrats began to affirm the message from Republicans in their public remarks and congressional letters, laying the groundwork that would set the stage for their most recent salvo, McCarthy's bid to remove her from her committee assignments. They say some Democrats, even voting against McCarthy's motion, reportedly continued to justify his actions and rehash old allegations against Omar. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries from New York, again, piece of trash here, said that the vote was about political revenge, true, but that Omar had clearly made mistakes and used anti-Semitic tropes. No, she didn't. Okay, it's not anti-Semitic if you have the same exact goddamn critique of the American political system and the baked-in corruption that we have effectively legalized and normalized in this country. That is not the same thing as an anti-Semitic trope. If you are applying the same critique to the Saudi government, then it's not anti-Semitic. It is just a principled critique of outside influence, outside money in our political system. That's what this is actually about. But they got a quote here saying that when Democrats were in control of the House, they were often attacking her for the same exact thing and throwing her under the bus when the Republicans started criticizing her, said Beth Miller, political director of Jewish Voice for, Act for Peace Action, and they have created an environment that shows that they are willing to attack and throw under the bus any member of their own party who calls for Palestinian human rights. Okay, so I mean, again, that's what this is about. This is about maintaining the hegemonic control over our foreign policy, specifically, specifically related to the Middle East and to the government of Israel, okay? I don't need to tell you guys this. I talk about it all the time on this channel. The government of Israel, according to every single reputable human rights organization around the world, including some that are based within Israel, like Beth Salem, have called the government of Israel and the policies that they deploy uh, akin to apartheid, okay? That is just a fact. That is a reality on the ground. You don't have to be a big fan of like Hamas or whatever to understand that reality that is playing out right now. Okay, so in the same way that people are now understanding of why people should have back then supported opposition and things like BDS, boycott, divestment, sanction for, uh, sanctions for the uh, government of apartheid South Africa, you should support the same thing now for the government of Israel. Okay, so Ilhan Omar coming out and talking about the financial influence of Israel lobbying groups like APAC over our political system, she is talking about corruption okay she's not talking about something that is unique to the jewish you know religion or the jewish faith or the jewish ethnicity okay she's talking about political corruption in the united states so this move to remove her from this uh this this committee position on the house foreign affairs committee i think it's an incredible loss i think that it's completely absurd i think it's based on a entirely false premise that we're talking about here at the same time it's also kind of interesting because a lot of leftists that I see in my inner circles actually have critiques from the left of people like Ilhan Omar and the rest of the members of the squad because they continue to support, you know, continued unquestioned aid to the government of Israel, the, you know, whatever, $3.8 billion per year that we give to them, largely, you know, military equipment and all of that stuff, right? There's actually a valid critique from the left that they are not doing enough to stand up against this unquestioned aid that we are giving to Israel and refusing to, you know, actually use some of the leverage that they have had in 
previous situations in order to try to apply some sort of standards on the aid that we give to Israel, right? I think that there's actually a valid critique from the left, but if you're going to come at this from the right and you're going to try to insinuate that Ilhan Omar is somehow anti-Semitic for having a critique of the government of Israel, then you have completely fucking lost the plot. Everyone is saying good politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like him. Believe me, everyone is saying things.